Have you ever played Bible roulette? You know when you sit down to read your Bible, but you don't really have a plan? It could be because you're in between studies, or maybe because you've never really read the Bible and you aren't sure where to start. Or it could be because you find yourself in a situation, desperate to hear from God, but you don't know what he wants to tell you. And so you sit down with great anticipation and hope, and you say a prayer to God along the lines of, okay, Lord, speak to me. Whatever you have for me today, take me there. And then you randomly flip open and put your finger down to start reading, and you're in one of the minor prophets. Listen, the minor prophets do not play well with Bible roulette. It isn't because they aren't helpful or rich or encouraging. If you've been with us through this series, you've seen that these books are very useful for us today. I think that the books of the minor prophets can be difficult to flip open to and just begin reading because the context for each one is so very different. Today, we're looking at the book of Obadiah. And before we jump in and start reading, wrapping our minds around the context will help us in important ways. To understand Obadiah, you have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 25, to the story of Jacob and Esau. Now, they were twin brothers, the grandsons of Abraham, and they could not have been more different. It would be like if if Benedict Cumberbatch and Joe Rogan were twins. It, It makes no sense, right? Esau, the older one, He had no regard for his role as firstborn in the family. He also showed no concern for their family status as God's covenant people. Well, Jacob took advantage of this, and he cheated his older brother out of his birthright and his blessing. Their rivalry caused Esau to want to kill his brother Jacob, who eventually fled hundreds of miles away. That rivalry didn't end with Jacob and Esau either. It continued on through their generations. Now, there's one more detail in their story that's important for us to note. Each of these guys have two names in the Bible. It's one of those Bible things. Jacob was also known as Israel, and Esau was also known as Edom. And their descendants came to be known by those names, the Israelites and the Edomites. Okay, now fast forward about 1,300 years. The rivalry that started between those two brothers has continued on through the generations for more than 1,000 years. The book of Obadiah records a message from God to the people of Edom, who are not God's covenant people. The other books of the Minor Prophets that we've looked at up to this point have all been addressed to God's people. Now, if you remember, let's let's talk about God's people. Uh, There was a civil war of sorts, and the nation of Israel split into two. The northern kingdom was known as Israel, and the southern kingdom became known as Judah, because that's where the tribe of Judah was. They coexisted together after this split, but they were never united again. Both nations lived out patterns of rebellion against God over time. Then God, in judgment against his people because of their rebellion, allowed the Assyrians to attack the northern kingdom. They were never restored. The people who lived there eventually became known as the Samaritans. It's helpful to know that by the New Testament times, the name Israel was reapplied to the southern territory and and the people of Jerusalem, the people who lived there. It's why we call that area Israel today. More than a hundred years after God allowed the Assyrians to destroy the northern kingdom, God then allowed the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem as a judgment for their continued rebellion and pride. The city was toppled and burned. The temple itself was looted People were killed. Some were captured and taken as slaves back to Babylon. The books of the Minor Prophets can be difficult to just jump into and start reading because each one was written at a different point in this historical story over a period of a few hundred years. The setting for Obadiah, though, is after these events, after Babylon has already attacked Jerusalem. Now, this image is taken from the Bible Project video for the book of Obadiah. As you see, Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament, and it contains poems of judgment against ancient uh, Edom. It's actually unique among the prophetic books because it isn't addressed to Israel or Judah. It was addressed to Edom. We're also not really given any information about the prophet Obadiah, which isn't altogether surprising considering the unique audience and the limited amount of text that the book contains. Let's talk about Edom. Edom itself was to the east of Jerusalem, It was in a mountainous region, and the people of Edom made their homes high in the cliffs. Think Greek islands like Santorini, 
You know the pictures of those beautiful white hillside homes with blue roofs and doors? A lot like that, just without the calamari and romantic sunsets. Edom existed where modern-day Jordan is today. Fans of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade will know that Petra in Jordan is the place where the temple is carved into the rocks. You know that iconic scene? Well, that temple was made just before Jesus lived, so it's actually quite some time after the events that we're talking about. But that gives you a sense of the terrain. Now, here's the specific setting for God's judgment on those Edomites. When the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem, the Edomites didn't step up to help their neighbors. They also didn't just sit on the sidelines and watch it play out. They actually joined in with the Babylonians. They rejoiced that Jerusalem was being toppled. They looted and pillaged. They captured Israelites and turned them over to the Babylonians. They even killed some Israelites who were trying to escape. Now, their crimes weren't captured on cell phone cameras and uploaded to YouTube like what happens today. But God saw what they did. And as you can imagine, he wasn't happy with them. Let's look to the book of Obadiah and listen to how God calls out the sins of Edom. Follow along and see if you can spot what they've done. We're going to read verses 10 through 14. God says, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of his distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of his distress. You see, what the Edomites did can't just be classified as part of a rivalry. It was egregious. What led them to do, out this, to do this evil, to carry out these things? Well, let's look. Verses 3 and 4 tell us. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, Though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. You see, God says that their pride is what led them to do this. They didn't just live up high in the cliffs. They actually thought of themselves as higher than others, as higher than their brother Jacob. There's even evidence that suggests because of their territory, where they lived and the way that they controlled trade routes, they saw themselves as a powerful nation, even though they were small. God says he will bring them down, way down. Listen to what their future holds as he pours out his judgment in this prophecy. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed, would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that, listen to this, every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. God promises total destruction. It won't be like a thief who just comes and takes one thing. When Edom is destroyed, they will take everything. Uh, when I was a teenager, I replaced the tape deck in my car with a CD player. It was a huge upgrade. Some of you know what I'm talking about back in the day, right? Well, one night when I was leaving my job at the mall, and already I know what you're thinking. You're like, CD player, job at the mall? Lance must have been pretty cool as a teenager. And you're not wrong. Anyway, I'm walking through the parking lot to my car, and as I get closer, I can see bits of plastic on the ground. You guessed it. Someone stole my CD player. They broke into my car and ripped it out of the dash. They, they broke bits and pieces of the dash, and even the controls for the air conditioner were, were ripped out. It was a huge mess, but they didn't take anything else. They left a, a case, a CD case, full of CDs. They even left the fuzzy dice that were hanging from my rearview mirror. 
I used to think that was bad until my friend Daryl had his truck stolen several years back. When they recovered his truck, everything was gone, all of it. The dash, the door panels, the seats, everything. He said the only thing left on the inside of that truck was the steering wheel. That's more like the destruction God is talking about in Obadiah. When thieves come, they won't be picky. They're taking everything. God says to them, listen, you won't even have allies to stand by your side because they will oppose you too. You'll be brought down, destroyed, forgotten about, wiped off the map. And in verse nine, every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. God did not mince his words. (laughs) This is some Old Testament anger. You can read this and get pumped up, right? God is going to repay the Edomites for what they've done to his people. There's a sense of justice there, and it's awesome. Except when you stop and think about it, isn't it somewhat ironic that God is upset with the Edomites? I mean, God himself is the one who allowed the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. This destruction was part of God's judgment. The Edomites didn't do anything that the Babylonians weren't doing. So so why this prophecy against Edom and their future destruction? Well, Old Testament scholar John Walton says this. Prophecy is more important for what it reveals about God than for what it reveals about the future. I'll read that again. Prophecy is more important for what it reveals about God than for what it reveals about the future. If this is true, we should ask, what does all of this tell us about God? If we take a step back from the book of Obadiah and consider why it was included in the Hebrew scriptures to begin with. I mean, it wouldn't have even been composed in Hebrew originally. The Edomites spoke a different language. What do these things reveal about God? Well, one answer to that question can be found back in verse 3. Let's read Obadiah verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? You see, God takes issue with their pride. And at first glance, that might not seem like a big deal. But when you consider all that the Bible has to say about pride, it becomes clear it's a huge deal. Now, theologian D.A. Carson, who is probably my favorite person to read and download, he says that there are more than 20 intercanonical themes that run through scripture. And I know it's a big word. I'm not a big word guy, but uh, others describe these, these as threads. They are these concepts that show up in scripture, but not just in one spot. They're, they're woven all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the historical books and the prophetic books and the books of poetry and in the letters to the early churches. These themes show up in, in all those places and every one of them intersects with Jesus in some way. Sometimes I imagine uh, opening my Bible and there just being these threads that connect all of this and to discover the way they interact is such a cool thing. Let me, let me give you an example. Even if you aren't familiar with the Bible, this, this will make some sense. One of the major themes in scripture is God's presence with his people. It starts in the beginning in Genesis. And you see, God creates, he gives order and purpose to everything that exists. And he places man and woman in the garden and he dwells there with them. He walks in the garden in the cool of the afternoon. But if you know the story, the people rebel against God and they can no longer dwell with him. But that thread continues because many generations later, God gives Israelites, his special covenant people, plans to build a tabernacle, which which means a residence or a dwelling place for God, which later becomes the permanent structure of the temple. And this was the place where God's presence would be among his people. He would actually physically come down. And this thread continues when many generations later, a baby was born, who is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus himself was the embodiment of God's presence with his people. He died on a cross, pouring out his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Now the Bible teaches and history tells us that Jesus rose from that grave and ascended into heaven. But if you keep going, if you follow the thread, the book of Acts shows us that God dwells with his people in a new way through the presence of the Holy Spirit in every believer. And that's the age we live in today. If you have trusted in Jesus, the Spirit of God lives in you, speaking to you, directing you, interceding for you, empowering you, growing you. It's beautiful. 
but it's a shadow of what is to come. Because if you continue to follow this thread all the way through the Bible, you'll see that in heaven, we will physically dwell with God in his presence. The distraction of sin will be gone and we will live as we are meant to with God. Now, do you see how God's presence with his people is a theme or a thread that can be traced throughout, throughout the Bible from the beginning all the way to the end? There are dozens more of these threads, one of which is pride and its opposite, humility. They go together. You see, pride and humility run all throughout these pages. And there is a connectedness to the pride displayed by the Edomites and to the pride displayed by the biggest names in this book. I'll just point out some of them. Adam and Eve. You see, pride caused them to, to desire to be like God. The people in the story of the Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Pharaoh, he saw himself as God. Moses put himself on God's level when he struck the rock with his staff. Samson, Saul, David, Solomon, I could go on and on. So many people in the Bible display pride and arrogance. And what does God think about that? Well, the Bible tells us it's part of this thread that runs through Scripture. Let's read Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in the heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. I mean, abomination, that's, that's big stuff. 13 verses later is the, the verse you're probably familiar with. Pride comes before the fall. Oh, what about in James chapter 4, verse 6? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Think about that. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 6 says God hates pride. That's really strong language. What do you hate? I'll tell you what I hate. I hate green peas. And I hate when people stop in the right lane at a red light and don't turn right and block me from being able to do so. And I hate the Yankees. Can I get an amen? My hatred for those things compared to God's hatred of pride aren't even in the same category. God hates pride. He opposes the proud. Consider that for a moment. God is in opposition to people with pride? You know, I think most of us are good with that part of who God is. I mean, we don't like proud people either, right? I bet right now you could easily name a celebrity or an athlete or a politician that is arrogant and proud. It isn't difficult to think of the people who bother us. You could probably even look to someone you're watching this with and just say that name out loud. You probably also don't have to think too hard to name someone that you know in your life that is proud and arrogant. It could be a family member or a coworker or a boss or someone you just sometimes cross paths with. And you can see the pride and arrogance in their lives. You can see its effects. You might even experience some of its effects. You can also see that it isn't good for them. It's not good for the people in their lives, right? Pride is dangerous for all the reasons you're thinking of. But pride is even more dangerous for the reasons you aren't thinking of. Pride is dangerous because we can see it in other people before we see it in ourselves. That's definitely true for me. So a couple of summers ago, my family and I went on a road trip across the southeast. My in-laws have a really nice travel trailer that they let us borrow. It's, it's pretty cool. It's got a queen bed up front for us, bunk beds in the back for the adults, a full kitchen, bathroom, a couple of air conditioners even. It's super nice. But this travel trailer is too big for my truck to pull it. It requires a super duty truck. So my brother was incredibly generous and let us borrow his top of the line F-250 to pull this thing. I didn't even know what deaf fluid was before this trip. Listen, we, we drove to North Carolina and back. That's how far we went. And we stopped to camp in some beautiful places across the Southeast in a borrowed camper being pulled by a borrowed truck. But something happened to me on that trip. I would drive all day across the states, like, you know, looking down at other people and their little cars and their toy trucks. And then I'd pull into a state park somewhere and back in and get set up. And I'd look over and see some poor sap with an older, smaller camper. You know, one without color changing LED lighting under his canopy. I'd almost feel bad for the guy and his sad, sad family. And then later, some other guy would pull into the campsite driving some obnoxious $200,000 motorhome tour bus thing. And I'd think, who does this guy think that he is? This is crazy, right? I was driving a borrowed truck 
I was using a borrowed camper. These things weren't even mine. Yet something broken in me had to justify my place in the RV hierarchy. What was that? Pride. Pride. Yeah, sure, my story is a bit embarrassing, but it's not my most embarrassing story about pride. My guess is you have embarrassing stories about your pride too. See, the definition of pride is to find deep pleasure or satisfaction in one's own, one's self, or to have a high opinion of one's own importance or merit or superiority. We've all thought too much of ourselves at times, am I right? One preacher I heard made the statement that it's not if pride exists in our hearts. The real question is where does pride exist in our heart and how is it being expressed in our lives? Pride can show up in subtle ways. I mean, we saw it in the Edomites. They, they neglected others, rejoicing at the downfall of other people. That's a clear display of pride. But, but in our lives, sometimes it shows up in more subtle ways. It can show up as constant fault-finding and criticism toward others. It can show up in the form of anger and harshness toward people we love. Do you struggle with being superficial? You care more about what other people think than uh, the truth of who you are or what God might think about you? It can show up as defensiveness. It can show up as a need for attention. You see, all of these things are warning signs, signs that pride exists in our hearts. And if pride exists in our hearts in those ways, you can bet it exists in the most dangerous way. In the Bible, the pride God hates most is when people choose self-will over his will. When people aspire to the status and position of God and refuse to acknowledge their dependence on him. And I know you were probably tracking with me until that part. You, you know that you've got some pride to deal with on some level, but you don't necessarily aspire to the status and position of God or refuse to acknowledge your dependence on him. Well, Pastor John Stott once said that pride isn't just the first of the seven deadly sins. It is itself the essence of all sin. You see, what he's saying is that pride is at the root of all of our sin. Pride, at its most fundamental, basic level, causes each of us to say, I know what's best for me. I know better than God does. Pride is what keeps us from being obedient to God. Pride fuels all of our sin patterns, from greed to lust to anger to laziness, all of it. John Stott also said that in every aspect of our Christian life, pride is our greatest enemy and humility is our greatest friend. This is a big deal in the Bible. It's huge. That's why James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Now listen, sometimes preaching feels impersonal to me. I mean, I'm the one doing all the talking. You're there listening. What I wish sometimes in the act of preaching is that what I really could do is pull up a chair, maybe in your living room or on your back porch or wherever you're watching this. I would love to have a conversation with you about all of this. I'd talk to you about my struggles with pride, and then I'd ask you questions about yours. But I think there would be a temptation to quickly solve our problem of pride by misusing this verse. It says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I mean, it seems like the solution is probably pretty easy, right? Like, we could sit and talk and decide real quick, well, we just have to stop being proud and start being humble, right? But it doesn't work that way. How many times have you tried to change yourself by attempting to stop doing one thing and start doing another? So often, it's a losing proposition. The Bible has something to say about how we should attack our pride. Paul instructed the church at Philippi about this. In one of those other places, this thread about pride and humility intersects Scripture. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And listen, we could stop right there and take those two verses and say, okay, here here are our instructions. We We need to be humble and think of other people first. You know, the Bible never gives us instructions without context. We can't just go start doing these things on our own. Listen to the context Paul gives for this. He says, 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, the answer for our problem isn't don't be proud or be more humble. Paul says the answer is to look to our Savior. If our conversation turned toward Jesus, what would we point out about him, you and me? We, we might point out that he is our creator. I mean, the Bible tells us that he created everything and he upholds it. That the creator himself took on the form of his creature. The king of the universe became a servant. He walked among us. He was tempted like us. He humbled himself through obedience. And that obedience led to his death. Death on a cross. And it's this that saves us through faith. You and I, we deserve God's anger and his judgment. Even that Old Testament anger we looked at earlier. But we're saved by faith in Christ. We don't deserve to be saved. We haven't done anything to merit salvation in grace. It is a gift. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, we can't look at Jesus and hold on to our pride. We can't brag about being Christians. Think about it. Humility was your posture at salvation. It had to be. You realized your need for grace. You placed your faith in Jesus. Paul says in Philippians 2 that when rooting out our pride, we should look again to our Savior, again and again and again. He will write you. He will remind you. He will change you. This is what it means to preach the gospel to yourself. If we sat down and talked, you and me, if you were honest in that moment, what would you say about your struggle with pride? Where is it in your heart? And how is it being expressed in your life? Are you overly critical? Especially to the people that you're closest to? Do you struggle with anger? Are you more concerned with what others think about you than what God thinks? Are you constantly posing the pictures and taking so many of them so that you can upload exactly what you want about your life to be seen by others and hoping that people like it? Are you more concerned about that than what God thinks of you? Are you so focused on yourself that you aren't loving others like you should? Do you find yourself being defensive? Listen, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I would say to you, look to Jesus be reminded of your need for a savior. Be reminded of his humility and obedience that saved you. Rest then in his forgiveness. You're already forgiven. Listen, you are free. Isn't it beautiful? Paul follows up this teaching by saying in the next few verses, therefore, now listen, therefore, therefore, because Jesus was humble, because Jesus took on the form of a servant, because Jesus gave himself for you out of his own obedience and died on the cross, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the exalted one. You and I can stop trying to be. His name is above every name, yours, mine, all of them. And there will come a day when every knee of every creature that has ever existed will bow at the name of Jesus. People from every nation, every tongue, every tribe will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what's so cool? Paul writes that here in Philippians, but it is connected by a thread all the way back to the book of Obadiah. Listen to this promise from Obadiah. We'll look at verses 15 and 21. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion or Jerusalem to rule Mount Esau 
and the kingdom, this is important, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The day of the Lord is synonymous with God's judgment and with celebration. The day of the Lord is one of those things. It's a concept in scripture. It has happened and it will happen. It has and it will. And on that day, every time, God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. It was true in Obadiah's time and it remains true today. God opposed the proud. Edom was wiped off the map, never to be heard from again. It remains true today. God will most, God will most certainly judge the proud. And it will most certainly be true in the age to come. So why is a message of judgment against the Edomites included in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament? Well, one reason is because it's a place, it's one of the places where God's hatred of pride and and his grace for the humble is on full display. As we've heard in some of the other books of the Minor Prophets, God maintains a remnant, those who are faithful and devoted to him. The humble. What was true then will be true now and in the future. And so here's how we're going to close today. We're going to close this this sermon with a moment of confession and assurance. This is a practice, an act of worship that we regularly incorporate into our services. It's meant to give us an opportunity to acknowledge that uh, to God that we know what he already knows to be true of us. And then after we do that, we take a moment and we remind ourselves of his goodness. And so wherever you are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to take a moment to speak to God. This is a chance right here in, in the midst of this, uh, this sermon, this service that you're watching, hopefully that you're participating in, that you would, you would listen to the words of Scripture. You would let them work in your heart. I'm sure some things have already come to the surface in your heart and mind, and that you would share that with God. You would tell him where you see pride in your heart and where you see it being expressed in your life. And so, before we go any further, I want to invite you, I want to ask you to take a moment, close your eyes or, or pause if you need to and, and confess these things to God. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So, as I said, when we, when we do this in our services, it's a moment of confession and then assurance. It's not enough just to confess what we, that we know uh, to be true of us that God already knows, but, but we should also take a moment and root ourselves and ground ourselves in the truth of who we are in the gospel. And there's great assurance in that. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2 what I've already read, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your scripture. We're grateful for the connectedness of it. We're grateful for the way that when we open your word, you speak to us. 
We're grateful, Lord, for the way you put the Bible together and and the way that we learn so much about who you are. And Lord, we're grateful for your words today from Obadiah, where you poured out your judgment against the proud. But we see as part of a bigger thread in scripture, Lord, that you give grace to the humble. And so, Lord, would you help us look to Jesus and be reminded first of, of his own humility, of his own willingness to step out of heaven and to take on the form of a servant, to be obedient to the point of death so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know grace upon grace, even though we don't deserve it, Lord. Would you remind us that all of this is your gift to us? And Lord, would you help us have great confidence and assurance that when we look to Jesus, we can let go of our pride. We can let go of all of the sin patterns that we want to hold on to, but we can rest in forgiveness and we can rest in our identity as your children. Lord, root us there. Remind us of your good gifts of grace. Change us from the inside out so that we would be more loving and more kind and more patient and care most about what you think. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the chance to gather across the Bay Area, even in this form, to worship together and to grow together in Christ. Lord, use it for our good and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.